Let me read to you a passage from the first chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 12 to 15. It's the Gospel for the first Sunday of Lent, year B. St. Mark writes, At once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That's from Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, for the first Sunday of Lent, year B. We hear in that reference to the kingdom of God. Now, St. Luke devotes 13 verses to our Lord's 40 days in the wilderness, chapter 4, one, verses 1 to 13. St. Matthew gives us 11 verses, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Each account follows a slightly different sequence, with a few other differences as well. John has no reference to the retreat into the wilderness, nor to the temptations. Mark, our Gospel today, gives it but two verses, chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, referring to the temptations without any detail. He adds that our Lord was with the wild beasts, and writes, as does Matthew, that the angels ministered to him. So Mark does not linger on this episode. His mention of it perhaps is meant to evoke memories of great milestones in the past which our Lord was bringing to fulfilment. It is the Spirit who leads Christ out into the wilderness. Well, we read in the book of Numbers that in the wilderness the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. And we read, and took some of the Spirit that was upon him and put it upon the seventy elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. Numbers chapter 11 verses 16 to 17 and then verse chapter 11 verse 25. So Moses had received the Spirit of God and the same Spirit was to a point granted to his 70 collaborators who would help him bear the load. They were in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. During this sojourn they were tempted and they failed including Moses himself Moses, who was the greatest of the prophets, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, and the friend of God, Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. None of them, except Joshua, would enter the promised land. Christ was now in the wilderness, led by the Spirit of God, and preparing to lead mankind into the ultimate promised land of heaven. He allowed Satan to approach and tempt him, thus placing himself within the stream of the chosen people and all humanity. But of course, Satan could make no headway with Jesus Christ. Perhaps too, the mention of his being with the wild animals conjured up not only the thought of the wilderness through which the children of Israel had to pass, but the beginnings, the very beginnings, the primeval situation of the first man and woman. They were placed by God in the garden among every beast of the field and every bird of the air. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19 to 20. There too they were tempted by Satan. As would the children of Israel, they succumbed and were cast out of the garden. Jesus Christ then, as the new Adam and the new Moses, proceeds through this initial wilderness triumphant. It is a foretaste of the final upshot that is never in doubt. The angels have attended him, and we recall how later, when in the wilderness of his agony in the garden, we read, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Luke chapter 22 verse 43. And moments later, entering the wilderness of his final struggle, he stated that if he so wished, 
twelve legions of angels would come to his aid. Matthew chapter 26 verse 53. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the revealed ideal of man who is faithful to God amid the wilderness of his struggles. But now, Luke brings us to what is his main point in that brief passage that I read earlier. Christ's proclamation of the kingdom of God and its requirement of repentance and faith. The kingdom of God. It was God who had led the children of Israel out of slavery to the promised land and he had done it through his servant Moses. He led them into the promised land through Joshua, again his servant. Once in the promised land, he had led them through the judges, the greatest of whom was Samuel, who may also be classed as the first of the major prophets within the promised land. Samuel was one of the very greatest figures of the Old Testament and there is no record of his failure to do God's will. Now, what do we notice in his institution at God's command of the Israel, Israelitic kingship, the kingship of Israel? When he became old, the people demanded that he appoint for us a king to govern us like the nations. First book of Samuel chapter 8 verse 5. This displeased Samuel and God said to him that, and I quote, they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. Chapter 8, verse 7 to 8. So the institution of the kingship was due to a loss of faith in God as their king. Thus was the kingship inaugurated with Samuel anointing Saul and then David. David's kingship was blessed, reached a zenith, collapsed in the following generations, but remained the inspired ideal and key to what was to come. God would send a Messiah, as we read in the book of Daniel, one like a son of man, and to him was given dominion, an everlasting dominion. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 to 14. This would be God's kingdom, in which God would be the Lord of his people, and in which, I quote, all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. It is this which Jesus Christ was now announcing. The kingdom of God, long expected, was near. In Jesus Christ, this kingdom has come and is present in the person of Jesus Christ. We enter the kingdom of God by entering into union with Jesus Christ and becoming his disciples. This we do by entering his church by faith and baptism. He is the church's divine head as members of his church, we receive the grace to live a life of ongoing repentance, of turning away from sin, of believing all that Jesus Christ has revealed as it is taught to us by his church. Let us then concentrate on working at repentance, especially during Lent, at turning away from sin, approaching with sincerity the sacrament of penance, and believing wholeheartedly the faith as taught by Christ's church.